In Revelation 9, at the fifth trumpet, the strangest and maybe the most dangerous creatures in the whole Bible rise out of the bottomless pit. And this year, one was discovered in Israel, and you won't believe where. And you won't believe what they look like, like horses with lion's teeth, scorpion tails, and a man's face. And when they sting people with that tail, the people long to die. It's that bad. And one of these bad boys was discovered in Israel this year. This is Bible teacher Nelson Walters. And you watch this channel because we report on issues like this that you just don't get elsewhere. When scholars have read Revelation 9 about these weird, bizarro creatures, traditionally, most of the scholars have thought it was just symbolic. Some have claimed they were depictions of helicopters. Some have thought it was a description of mental illness. Some have thought it was a symbol of Rome, and others a symbol of the Antichrist's followers. But those ideas make no sense at all, because these creatures come out of the bottomless pit. Everything that the scholars have determined that was symbolic were just guesses. Especially after folks in the Middle East found a couple of these strange-looking things. So almost certainly, Revelation 9 is a literal description of what they are. And yes, I understand that is very frightening. So today, we're going to examine what the Bible says about what these creatures are, the mysterious spot in Israel where one of them was recently found, and what the future of man will be like when these creatures are loose on the earth. So let's get started with what the Bible says about these descriptions. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, and their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. And they have tails and stings like scorpions. And their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. Revelation 9, 7 through 10. Now, that's quite a description. You can see why a scholar who kind of shies away from the supernatural might want to think this is only symbolic, like a mental illness. Because if it's literal, it's right out of a nightmare. It's mental illness in the real world. Interestingly, in ancient mythology, there was a creature just like this, known as the manticore. In Old Persian, it was called the Martyavara, which means man-eater. In Indian and Persian mythology, this legendary creature is similar, by the way, to the ancient Sphinx. Part man, part lion with a scorpion tail, and many times with wings. It is also similar to the mythical creature called the Chimera, which had a couple heads, a lion and a goat. Were these three creatures really all recollections by ancient man of the same thing, of the same creature? When we look at the Sphinx in Egypt, are we looking at the recollection of what these Revelation 9 creatures really are? Did creatures like this once exist on the earth? Maybe. Maybe in the pre-flood days. We know from the non-canonical book of Enoch that the angels who descended in the days of Jared sinned against the animals. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish. Enoch 7, 5-6. Well, how did the angel sin against animals? Was it by creating hybrid animals that were contrary to God's plan? Part this, part that, etc. Interestingly, the word we use in English for this is chimera. And, you know, people today are trying to create these chimeric animals. And chimera is something that is, you know, part one thing, 
and part another. Genetically, at least. And that's what that two-headed mythological creature is. And it's similar. Very similar to the Revelation 9 creatures. So that's our theory. That these were real, live creatures at one time. Probably before the flood. Probably the result of genetic manipulation. That's speculation on our part. But it seems a logical idea. What we know for sure is they're still alive and they are in the bottomless pit and they will be released in the near future, possibly the very near future. And for this video about this amazing find in Israel, we need to give a shout out to Michael Tarrant of our advisory board who helped research it for us. Now, where do they come from? The Bible tells us that as well. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit. Revelation 9, 1 through 2. So at the fifth trumpet, a star fallen to earth opens up the bottomless pit and lets them out. Is this a literal space object star like an asteroid? Well, maybe. Could be. But notice, it's referred to as he. So instead, maybe it's an angel, since angels are also called stars. And if it's a fallen star, maybe it's a fallen angel. And this star is given the key to the bottomless pit or abyss, the lowest level of Hades, sometimes called Tartarus in the Bible. This star is given the key. So who gave it to him? Why, God, of course. Jesus holds the key of death in Hades. So God imprisoned the angels there, and likely these creatures as well. So God allows their release, probably making this part of the wrath of God, don't you think? And unlike regular locusts, Revelation tells us these guys aren't allowed to eat leaves or grass. They are specifically forbidden to do that. Their purpose is to sting human beings who do not have the seal of a living God on their foreheads. And we're told they're given this power to torture non-believing humans for five months. So from this, we know that these creatures come up out of the bottomless pit during the tribulation period, and we know the fallen angels who descended on Mount Hermon were imprisoned in that same place by God in chains. We know this from Peter and Jude. If these locust creatures come out of the abyss or pit, is it possible they were imprisoned there with the fallen angels back at the time the angels were sent there? If they were on the earth at one time and seen by men and descriptions of them were made, how else did they get into the bottomless pit? Now, this is just a theory, but to me, it makes a lot of sense. So this would place the creatures pre-flood. And all the Sphinx statues and Manticore statues in the ancient world were all based on word-of-mouth recollections by Noah and his family about what these creatures were like. I'm sure they made quite an impression. But look at this ancient statue of one from Persia. Look at how much this one looks like what we're talking about. Notice there's a crown on its head and it's a man's face woman's hair, wings, a breastplate, a scorpion tail. I think we have a match. The ancient world was full of these statues. Look at how similar the Sphinx in Egypt is to this guy. And in this picture, look at the heavy erosion on the sides of the body of the Sphinx. This is why many think the Sphinx is a pre-flood construction, that it was damaged and eroded that way in the flood. So where was this modern Sphinx, Chimera, Manicor found? You know the one found in Israel? It was found in the Bashan area, in the area not too far from Mount Hermon, where the fallen angels or watchers descended. This is the same region where the giant king, Og of Bashan, lived. It was an area of great evil, witchcraft, and even chimeric creatures and genetic hybrids. After all, it was ruled by a giant, which was a hybrid. 
So it's not surprising that the creature was found near here in something called Tel Rakesh. Tel Rakesh is located where two rivers join, the Nahal Tavor and the Nahal Rakesh, far from any paved roads. I mean, it was out in the boondocks. This secluded location has ensured that the mound Tel Rakesh was not excavated until 2006. Its location, you know, back in the old days and ancient times, was no less remote, making one wonder why such a large site was built in such a way out of the way location. And to add to the mystery of the site, a monumental stepped structure has been discovered at the site, like maybe the base of a ziggurat or pyramid. This area eventually became part of the northern kingdom of Israel. And in 720 BC, due to their wicked ways, God allowed the kingdom to be destroyed and the ten northern tribes of Israel to be scattered to the wind. You know, their wicked ways involved pagan worship, maybe even of creatures like this. We don't know. The Assyrians then forced other groups to settle in that area. They brought people from all over their kingdom and resettled the area that they had just thrown the Israelites out of. This is part of the Assyrian strategy. And the archaeologist who excavated the area guessed that the group came to this region from Babylon Sumer. So it makes sense. A ziggurat, Babylon had that. A sphinx chimera manticore in the same region, Babylon had that. Just like Babylon and just like Egypt. So it appears that pyramids and sphinxes are both related to the worship of the ancient gods and maybe this type of creature. And in the region, this region of Tel Rakesh is where the creature was found on this beautiful amulet with a carving that was probably used like a seal for embossing wax. So you are asking someone's seal was this demonic creature? Of course, Assyrians used a very similar creature called the Lamassu to guard their palaces and temples. This amulet is very striking. It's carved on a semi-precious stone known as carnelian, which was found in Revelation, by the way. It's found around the throne of God and on the walls of the New Jerusalem. Many scholars believe the 12 stones mentioned in the book of Revelation all refer to aspects of God. In this case, they believe carnelian refers to God's wrath or to bloodshed. And since the creature on the amulet is part of God's wrath, this would be very appropriate. It was also found on the breastplate of the high priest in the Old Testament and represented the Hebrew tribe of Reuben. And it, like we said, it's usually a blood red color. And sometimes this stone is translated as the Sardius stone, which is possibly where the city of Sardis one of the seven churches of Revelation gets its name. Now let's look at this creature because it's really cool. First, outlined in black, it's easy to see the winged horse, right? You can see that. Now less easy to see is the lion's head. So we outlined that in blue. And even less easy to see is the human head with a crown and women's hair. Now, the crown is unusual, kind of looks like a Philistine crown or maybe a Assyrian crown. It's not the type of crown that you might expect, which would be the type of crown worn by someone, you know, uh, in the Middle Ages or something with the points. Very different, more like a, a helmet type crown. And finally, much easier to see, is the scorpion tail, and we outlined that in yellow. Now, a year and a half ago, we reported on a similar creature that dates back to the earliest days of ancient Sumer and the days of the Tower of Babel. Why does it look different than the amulet creature? Well, remember, 
we're talking about what was likely a word-of-mouth description of something that was seen in pre-flood days. So there were only eight people who could have reported on what these creatures looked like. And um, so how those descriptions were interpreted could differ slightly, but the basic idea is the same. And here's a clip from that video featuring Dr. Doug Hamp. Yeah, so as you as you summarized in, in Corrupting Image Volume 2, I talk a lot about Nimrod, and I show in the ancient world uh, a cylinder seal from about 2300 BC. And there you see Inanna, who is the woman that rides the bees, right? She's riding a beast, right? And, and that's what's so amazing is you see Mystery Babylon on the back of this beast. Riding a beast who is very similar to these creatures. A woman riding the beast, just like Mystery Babylon is described. So how did the ancient Sumerians know about this beast and know about the woman riding the beast? And the beast is an Anzu bird. It's a, it's a hybridized creature. It's a lion, an eagle, some kind of a mix between them. And as that, that creature goes on in, in uh, history, it uh, has different uh, forms that it takes. And by the time we get to around 1200 BC, it has become stylized as more of a centaur, which is really interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. A centaur with two heads, uh, eagle's wings, a scorpion's tail, a serpent head phallus, in fact. And that is exactly what we see in Revelation chapter 9. Right? And this absolutely blew my mind. Later, what we found on this, this thing called a Kuduru stone from about 1200 BC, where it has more of a mantic or has more of a, um, a centaur shape, right? So it has, again, that basic form of a, a horse, but it has eagle talons. Uh, it has a man's head and a lion's head, <clears throat> which is very interesting. And a so, scorpion tail, which is very important. Yep. And the to... scorpion tail and mm -hmm. the serpent head phallus. All right. All right. Okay, Doug, why don't you tell us what we're looking at there? All right. So this is the Kuduru stone from 1200 BC. Now it's a little bit hard to see because uh, you can't quite see all of it just based on the, the glare and such. But uh, if you take a look there, you can see this is a centaur. It's got the shape of a horse, but obviously it has eagle's wings. It has a scorpion's tail. It has a, a, a serpent head phallus. And if you look at the heads, you can see that there's actually one head facing forward. That's the man's head. And the head that's facing backwards, that's the lion head. So this is an even older rendition of what I just showed you. This is from about, I think, 3000 uh, BC. So um, this is from Uruk. So here you can see it in even more detail. You can really see on the hind legs there, it's got the eagle talons, right? And the, the, obviously the front uh, legs are more horses hooves. Now, what happens when these creatures are released from the bottomless pit? They sting people. We've already talked about that. With those tails causing so much pain that people want to die. But here's a the kicker. They can't die. This has to be one of the strangest ideas in the Bible. Everyone can die, right? In fact, that's a problem. We do die. That's one of the reasons why Jesus came to the earth to grant us eternal life for those who believe. But why can't these folks die? You know, suicide is so common in today's world. But in the world of the time of the end, things are going to be different. That's what it teaches us. Humans will be different. And a lot of that may have to do with worship of the beast. Click right here to keep watching and discover how worshiping the beast might alter a person so they can't die, even if they want to. Till then, this is Nelson. And I'll see you there.